Hi, everybody. This is Bob Goodwin, and welcome to another episode of Career Club Live. Today's episode is brought to you by some new free resources we're making available on career.club. Uh, things like the three things that might be holding you back in your job search, how to effectively answer what's your greatest weakness, and some networking tips. We work a lot with clients that networking is a funny business and they're a little confused on what to do. So please download our free guide on how to make the most out of networking. You can get all that at career.club and then just click on for job seekers. It's all free and we'd love to connect with you that way. So today I am very excited about our guest. He's got a quite impressive background. And because of that, I'm going to read most of it here. But uh, our guest today is David Dittenfock, and head of emerging products and segments for Fidelity Investments. In his role, David leads a portfolio of products, including digital advisory services, Fidelity Bloom, and Fidelity Youth Account, and growth segments such as workplace customers, women investors, and next generation young customers. Formerly the CMO and head of experience design, he led marketing experience design teams across the enterprise. We're gonna get a little bit deeper into his background, but before we do anything else, David, welcome. Great to see you, Bob. No, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's great to be here. Cool, where are you dialing in from today? I'm in Boston today. Awesome, so you're at the home office today at the home office. Cool. Well, as is our want to do, let's sort of uh, run through some quick icebreakers so people can get to know you a little bit. So we'll start with an easy one. Where were you born and raised? Mm. Well, I am mostly from Wisconsin, uh, but I'm not a total cheesehead. I was born actually in <laughs> Connecticut. My parents lived there for a year, but I mostly grew up in Wisconsin, other than a couple years where I got to live abroad. I actually got to live in the UK while I was growing up a couple of years. Did you pick up a football club while you were in the UK? Yeah, well, in the Wayback Machine, yeah, the Queens Park Rangers, and I don't really UPR, know. UPR, come on. No, oh, I love it. I love it that you know that. I had the scarf and everything. Went to a couple of games. Yeah. I guess my friends were into it. I have, I have no idea really how the league works, to be honest. But I was a fan. I, anybody that's watched this for a half of a second knows I love Liverpool stuff. But we'll <laughs> <laughs> and then a little bit about where you went to school. Well, I went to school in Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, and then I ended up on the East Coast partially because I think my parents are both New Yorkers, so. Yep. I had that pull to the East Coast. I went to Brown, and after working and consulting for a few years, I went back to grad school at Harvard Business School. Awesome. Well, that that's very impressive, and no wonder you're where you are. Just a little bit about your family. Uh, when we were getting to know each other before, you you said that your dad would actually was a teacher and a professor in, in Appleton. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. My dad is a professor. It's just just retired. Um, actually, my parents were both educators in in Appleton, Wisconsin. That's so I come cool. from an and academic then, background. And then, and then your uh, your family with uh, wife, kids? Yeah, so my my nuclear family is my wife and I married 22 years. Um, and um, we have a five-year-old son. So we waited nice. a little while and then a little while longer. And we are very blessed to have a very energetic five-year-old. Well, you young parents are so cute. I admire you. <laughs> <laughs> if no, you need no, any no, advice, no, I'm your no. guy. Um, so I'd love for people just to get a little bit of a sense of your background, because we're going to tap into it, but just a little bit about your career arc coming out of school. Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, after after um, undergrad, I actually, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do, but I ended up becoming a consultant. Um, I had the, uh, the fortune to work at McKinsey and Company, which is an amazing experience. As I yes. said, I hadn't, I hadn't had a business background at all. And I give McKinsey a lot of credit for teaching me so much uh, in such a short amount of time. So that was a very formative experience. Um, and then after grad school, I ended up uh, at Procter & Gamble, which was another really formative experience, you know, really um, on the classic brand management track, you know, wasn't sure what I would do with it, but just you learn so much on that track. Um, and that, you know, that led me eventually to Fidelity. After, after Procter & Gamble, I also spent a time at Bank of America. So my entree into financial cool. services was after almost a decade and a half at Procter & Gamble. And now I'm about the same amount of time in financial services. No, that's awesome. And we're going to talk about that that intersection here in a minute. Last icebreaker question. When we don't find you doing cool, innovative things in the financial services industry, what do you like to do in your, your office? Yeah. Well, you know, um, pre our son, we were, we were right. all over the globe. We did a lot of travel. We were told that that would be a good thing to do, you know, travel while you're young. And we, uh, we yeah. did that. It's funny because we started to mark on a map all the dots of all the places that we've been. Mm -hmm. And now, 
with Alex, we are uh, doing the same with him. So he has fewer dots, but we're hoping to continue that tradition. You know, when, when you have a baby, it's definitely a lot of work and he's five, as I said. So now, you know, he's on, he can sort of hold his own when we're doing some, some bigger travel. So I look forward to that. And then there's a lot of sports as any parent will know. Uh, he's right at that age where he's figuring out what sports he likes to do. So I've, I've been on the basketball court, soccer field, baseball, diamond. You know, my Saturday mornings are pretty much going to be sports related. Amen. Yeah. Um, sometimes I try to pitch in coach as best I can, that kind of thing. Um, and my one sort of flow, you know, moment alone, if I get the time, would just be uh, I love I love to go on a road bike and just just, you know, clear, clear my mind. It's one of my mm. passions. How, how, how long will a bike trip go? Oh, man. You know, again, like before kids, I could sort of like, you know, do it for several hours and come back and take a nap. <laughs> you know, I think uh, this is negotiable as to how long a bike ride, you know, but uh, enough to tire me out for sure. Mm. So let's, let's kind of move into the, the worky part of all of this stuff. You know, I love talking with marketers, you know, consumer insights, consumer brands, you know, why we do what we do is interesting. You, you had mentioned that you really did get classically trained at Proctor. And of course, all roads to genius lead through Cincinnati. So there you go. <laughs> but, you know, you've had, you know, senior marketing roles in financial services. Where do you see kind of some of the similarities? What's in, you know, what, what did you carry forward? And maybe what's different about financial services versus traditional CPG? Yeah. You know, I think, you know, it's amazing. You know, people from Procter & Gamble seem to go all over the place. And I always kind of want to know why, why is that? And. I think it's been true throughout my whole career that, um, I mean, the technology, the context of business has changed so much in the three decades that I've been doing this and every generation feels like change is just accelerating. And it is, you know, uh, I have found that the mind of the consumer, you know, us as humans, um, luckily we, we don't evolve actually as fast as the context that we all live in. So we'll, the, the technology around us changes really rapidly. How we consume that at a fundamental level, I'm not sure it actually changes that much. So, you know, how to really think about the basic motivators of all of us and how to do that analytically, uh, th those building blocks I've used over and over and over again. Um, financial services, like like all industries, but particularly industries that have been digitized, I mean, the transformation is pretty unbelievable. I mean, by the time I got there, and this is now almost 15 years ago, you know, ATMs, for instance, ATMs were just starting to accept, you know, that you could put cash into an ATM and not just get it out. Mm -hmm. um, we were there for the very first time that you could deposit a check on your phone instead of having to Which go. Which is very the cool. I'm, I still am amazed by mobile check deposits. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's transformational, right? I mean, you know, instead of having to go to a bank, you you have the bank that's, that's basically in your pocket. Um, the way we've served customers in this industry is just completely transformed. I mean, most people would prefer never to have to call or or come into a branch of a financial institution. That dramatically changes how you think about relationship building, dramatically changes how you think about communications, um, changes how you think about deepening a relationship you have with a customer. You know, it uh, used to be you'd come in and you'd make an appointment, sit down and have a long conversation. Well, that sometimes happens. More and more of this is happening digitally. Well, I, I'm thinking about a couple things. I mean, one is, you talked about how people think and, and are we're kind of the same critters that we've been for a long time. The, the technology around us changes. Money is a very emotional topic. And in, do, you, do you find that still the case? Or are people's attitudes towards money changing? Finances, wealth, security, yeah. all those things? Yeah, I mean, I guess money is the ultimate expression of lots of things about our priorities and, and our values. And um I don't think the fundamentals necessarily are changing, but I do think that the way people converse about money, I think, is changing. So money money can be a very taboo and a very private subject. And on some level, I think it still is. But uh, there has been a transformation. The younger generation is they have these channels to find out about money in ways that just didn't exist before. Uh, I was just looking at this on uh, this amazing statistic on, on TikTok. If you look at the hashtag money, I think it's one hundred and forty seven billion with the beans. Yeah. And uh, you know, I had to look because I was looking at this last night. And I had to like look at it again with my glasses, my readers on. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I don't think you would have predicted that platforms that you could say are mostly for entertainment. One of the top things that's happening across social media is people looking for information about money. And that it takes all kinds of different forms. It may not be sophisticated investing. It could just be the basics of budgeting and 
spending and saving and things like that. But young people are wanting that information really badly and they're wanting that information from other people they can get it from. It could be an influencer, but honestly, a lot of it just starts at home. I mean, as much as all this media has increased the number of ways you can get that information, young people still want to want their parents, you know, to help them out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've tried to get after that at Fidelity very, very directly with some of our solutions. Like we have this, this youth app that we've just launched and it's about the connection, you know, of the parents and, and the teens, because the teens really need that guidance. You know, generationally, if this is wrong, like you know, jump in, I'm just sort of teeing it up, but, you know, boomers, maybe Gen X, money is like very private. Um, millennials, you look at apps like Venmo, if you're sharing kind of publicly, hey, I just paid David, you know, 20 bucks because we went yeah. and got a beer together. Yeah. And then Gen Z is like, well, how much do you make? How much mm-hmm. do you make? And there's yeah. just like, there's no barrier. It's like, well, what's your problem? Why wouldn't we be talking about this? And they're just very mm-hmm. sharing kind of a mentality. Is that what you guys see? To some extent, um, you know, I, I, there's definitely some of that, you know, Venmo and, and the kind of the social aspect of that. Honestly, though, our our research by and large says that that, that might be more the exception. Maybe not how much you sent, you know, for pizza or something like that. Right. But as far as, you know, how much money I make and how much I have invested and what are my money worries? Some of that is still pretty sensitive. And I think even young people, to some extent, find that to be a little bit personal information. Yeah. So you, you mentioned young people and, you know, still looking to their parents, you know, and rightfully so, I would suppose, you know, for, for guidance. Do you see generationally who's influencing people about financial advice, financial information? Does that change by generation with advisors and banks and online resources, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think most of the big financial institutions are trying to educate their customers in one way or another. I think it's become just an expectation. As I said, a lot of it starts at home. I mean, um, despite all the new ways you could find out about money and and values, um, young people are still looking for home and their parents to give them information. Part of what we found is that that can open up a door for us so that sometimes the the children are asking their parents for education and that opens a door for us to better educate the parents. You know, um, as I said, this, this solution we have is, is got a parent version and a, and a teen version and yeah. both of them benefit from having that conversation. If there's questions, they can come to fidelity. But the fact is, you know, they're also going to go to influencers. They're going to go to social media. They're going to go to Google. They're not, they're not necessarily looking for a brand, you know, to be the only source of information. Um, but I think brands do have a, place to play. I think that, you know, if you're a trusted brand, that that can be a place, especially when you get into like, how do I actually solve a financial problem, which obviously is what our industry is about. And then, then I might really want some information from someone like Fidelity. You, 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 I'm thinking of at least two pillars and I'm sure there, there's more. One is information transparency. Just, just make this information available to me, please. Uh, part of it's tech, which you talked about earlier, you know, kind of the rapid, uh, pace of change with technology. You just brought up relationships, maybe slash trust. What are some of the other avenues, levers around innovation that your financial services is bringing to the market? Yeah, well, I mean, every aspect of our business, like all businesses is pivots on innovation. You know, a lot of the innovation I've seen in the last decades is also operational types of innovation. I mean, the back office has been completely transformed in our industry. Think about the amount of paper statements and checks and other kinds of paper that really made the system go and how much that's been digitized. Yeah. Um, that that has great environmental, you know, benefits, has economic benefits in terms of the cost. You can get massively better scale in a digital model, but also means there's a lot better information we have on what our customers are actually doing, right? We can actually follow them through the experience and guide them. So, you know, if someone comes into the experience and is reading about certain articles, we can use that to say, would you like some articles like this, right? So we can personalize the experience based on these digital touch points in a way that analog, you know, just didn't work. Um, But then there's also consumer facing, you know, innovation. Um, You know, I, I helped develop with a great team here um, an app that we call Bloom. And it was it was trying to solve this problem of a lot of young people are at that pivot point where they're trying to save enough money to become an investor, but you know they have debt and they're not sure how to balance that. So you know this innovation gives people little sort of micro incentives 
to become a saver so you can become an investor. So it gives you cash back when you swipe your debit card. It gives you a match when you save your first few hundred dollars in the app. Um, and it, it's kind of like the consumer goods insight, like a little bit of dopamine, a little bit of pleasure. Oh, the word dopamine is going to come out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, it's not dissimilar. Like I, I worked on Crest toothpaste, and obviously there's a good, you know, pharmacological benefit to brushing your teeth with fluoride, right? But the industry learned that putting great flavors in there, great packaging in there, you know, making it also a little bit of fun. I mean, it's exactly, I think, the same insight that people know they should have better financial habits, but if you can make it more fun and interactive, which is what we're trying to do with this particular solution, um, there's just a lot of innovation, I think, in that space as well. And a lot of the fintechs, I give a lot of credit for trying to innovate in that space as well. Do people's interest in new financial offerings, new financial innovation, does it uh, accelerate more when things are going well in the economy and I don't want mm. to miss out? Or mm. is it like, oh, crap, I'm really worried about the recession <laughs> and debt and whatever, and I need to I need to figure my stuff out? Yeah, great question. I mean, the, the 101 is that when the markets are up, more people get interested in the markets. Um, now, one, one could argue that it should be exactly the opposite, you know, that <laughs> when the markets are volatile can create amazing opportunities to get in for the long term. So, um, We've seen that when the markets when the markets are up, we do see more young people, you know, coming in. However, um, you know, the the essence of a long term financial outcome often is just having a really good plan and sticking to it, right? And so, mm -hmm. one of the things that we at Fidelity try to do is, especially when things are rocky, is remind people that they should have a plan for the long term and they should really stick to that plan in the long term because trying to react to a specific market environment usually is not a very good way to drive the long term outcome that you're trying to drive. Young people haven't seen a lot of those cycles, right? As, as you get older, we've all sort of seen that markets can go up and down. And so it's a little bit easier um, to say, look, from history, really, you should stay with your plan. For young people, that may be their first downturn and they don't understand as much how that can play out over the long run. So we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that people stick with their plans. Well, what you said is a springboard, because I feel like we've sort of been holding something behind the uh, the curtain here for a minute. So you guys are just launching Crypto Info on Fidelity Youth. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. We just launched into that. Could you explain you. kind of just a little bit about what it is and why it is? What was the insight and why yeah. Fidelity Youth? Why now? Yeah. I mean, we, we have this teens and money study and, and um, it's been very consistent that it says 75 percent of teenagers are interested in investing and know investing is important, but only 25 percent of them have ever considered actually doing it. So that's a huge gap. Right. So like teenagers. Right. Yeah. They, they, these are teenagers. I mean, we obviously serve all ages, but um, you know, teenagers, they're developing financial habits, they're developing attitudes about money, and these attitudes can stay with them for an entire lifetime. Also, we ask teenagers to start making pretty big financial decisions. You know, many of them are having a debit card before they go to college, but many of them are getting their first credit card, potentially the first week they're at college. You know, once you're 18, yeah. you can you can get a credit card. And by the way, you may be getting student debt. So these are big financial decisions that sneak up on you, right, when you're 18. Sure. So, so the insight we had, and, and in 20, um, 2021, we launched an account that was specifically designed for teenagers age 13 to, to 18. Mm -hmm. And what was unique about it is it's not a custodial account. It's actually an account that's owned by that teenager, but it has to be sponsored by a parent. Because as I said, you know, teenagers and parents, that, that bringing together of conversation and, and education and values is really where the magic is. But uniquely, this would let um, these teenagers have a debit card but also an investment account. Now there's no options or margin, you know, so it's, it's not, there's not, not a lot of ways to get way over your skis on this, but we, we ran this experiment and we weren't sure how many people would want to do it. What are they going to invest in? Are they going to invest wisely? Are they going to talk to their parents? Are their parents going to be part of the, the conversation? And it's just, it's been really successful. So over the last couple of years, we've watched that grow and we realized that we really want to dedicate experience. So this youth app takes that basic idea, but now we've added some features such as, we, we've seen this trend in social where young people are trying to sort of think about the different places their money goes. You know, I have the short term spending, I have the long term where I'm spending on something for today versus next week. And, and there's this idea of like putting it in different envelopes yeah. so I can remember what that money is for. And I'm not tempted to just spend it all on one thing. So we took that idea of envelopes and actually digitized that. So, you know, this this youth app actually gives you these buckets where you can put money in. And, you know, this one could be for my skateboard and this one could be for saving for college, you know, whatever buckets that you want to set up. Um, it retains the idea of investing and um, being able to spend, 
but it also has, has things like education with small incentives to actually gain the education. And again, the parents are also involved. So the parents have their own version of the app where they can see the education as well and hopefully mm -hmm. spark, spark a conversation. So it's the first time we've had an app that's a you know unique experience. The teens and the parents can come together and it's designed just for them. And how are the, how are the teens finding it? Where, where, where do they, how are they encountering the app? Yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously, if you go Fidelity um, um, Youth in the app store, you can find it, but also we will advertise it on our own properties and third third party social media and things like that as well. So people can find it that way. Yeah. Okay. Now that makes sense. If you're talking to parents right now, Dave, because I'm going to guess I've got more parents and uh, teenagers. Yeah, that's probably on this. Want. Yeah. If you're talking to parents, what are the maybe two or three main bits of advice that you would give them to, to really yeah. teach lessons that are going to stick? Yeah. Well, <laughs> As a parent of a five-year-old and uh, an older one, I've sought out all kinds of parenting advice. So I'm not going to at all say that I'm the expert in giving out parenting advice. But um, you know, I can say that what I'm trying to do. So first of all, it's probably not too early to start talking about money. Um, you know, Alex is five years old. We decided that we would give him a dollar a week, you know, allowance, and we wanted to observe, you know, what's he actually doing with it. And when he wants to spend it, we'll have a conversation about that. I think that those are very fundamental habits. You know, I, you know, the whole marshmallow eating, you know, test, whether or not, you know, that that's a specific, very famous piece of research, but I do think there's something real there. I think again, very similar to like, I've worked in healthcare and beauty care, right. And like, how do you get people to put on sunscreen every day? How do you get people to floss every day? Like these long-term habits that are good, you know, in 20 years, they often start with a micro habit about today. Yes. And, and getting someone to focus on that. So I think it's never too early to try to get with your children to talk about those habits and, and those values. Um, you know, I won't get any kind of specific financial advice, but certainly if you're starting to work, you know, it opens up all kinds of doors for things you can do. You can start to save and, you know, there's great rates right now on, on savings. Um, you can think about a Roth IRA, incredibly, you know, um, great way to invest for the long term. And obviously there, there's products like 529. So, you know, there's, there's solutions that I think are really, really unique that both parents and, and kids can think about that can really help them in the long run. Does Alex have to do anything for his dollar? Yeah, he has to clean up his playroom every week. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's all so we Money's have. not free. There's a lesson right by itself. I have to That's earn right. my dollar. That's right. That's right. That's, That's right. cool. Um, I want to, uh, is there anything else just, just on Fidelity Youth and just sort of, again, if you're just sort of broadly talking to parents or kids about money before we pivot into a little bit of career stuff? No, I mean, I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll make one other observation. Um, a lot of people are really intimidated by the idea of investing. And mm. I think that putting your toe in the water is is not a bad idea. You know, you know, there's no fees and there's no minimums, for instance, at Fidelity. And there's a lot of others that are either close to that or, you know, very low fees and minimums. And so it's it's never been a better time to be an investor. You know, it used to be you had to pay big commissions and have minimum balances and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of that friction has gone away in the industry, which it's just a great time for someone young or old who's never, you know, said, you know, I'm going to be an investor to go try it and kind of go see how that actually works. Um, you know, the other thing I, I work as, um, as we talked a lot on how to get more women interested in investing. And, you know, one yeah. of the observations we've had on the youth account before this app launch, because the app launch is very recent is, there's still this gap. There's still this gap that boys are more interested in investing. Um, they're investing at a higher rate. And it even is true of our, this, this teen experience, we're seeing more boys than girls. And, you know, I don't have easy answers as to why that is, but I think that it's really important that both parents, you know, have these same conversations and encourage their girls as much as their boys to be interested in, in how money works and investing and, you know, thinking about the long term. I, I, Pure hypothesis. I'm, I'm just curious if any of that is competitiveness, you know, and gamification and things that, you know, would look, you know, just maybe skew slightly more masculine than feminine sometimes of like, I want to win. I want to, I want to beat the game here. Yeah, um, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, again, everyone's different. So, you know, you, you can't just say it's all because of, of gender, but like I think there's something about um, women may be really, really good at saving, but some on average might be less willing to say, I'm going to invest because it has, you know, has risk associated with it. Obviously, you've got to be able to ride out the ups and downs. And again, that's why 
both you know, all of us can benefit from a long-term plan, right? Because if you're, again, looking at the ups and downs of the market, that's not really what this is about in the long run. It's investing for the long run where the returns are, um, you know, are smoothed out. Well, I, I appreciate the fact that you're just focused on it because anytime, you know, on a gender basis, there's disequilibrium, you know, it's like, well, there's got to be some underlying cause and how can we help bring it back, you know, to what should be more balanced than it is. And so the fact that you're focused on that, I think is super encouraging. So thank you actually for, for doing that. You remember at Proctor when they did like a girl, did you remember that video, oh, yeah. the viral oh, video? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And it's almost like invest like a girl. Mm. It, it's like, yeah. you, you know, this isn't just for the boys. This isn't just a dad thing. This is like yeah. boys and girls, men and women, you know, equally can participate in this and benefit from this. And, and we don't learn to give up, you know, understanding how money works, that, that I don't cede control to somebody else for that. Well, it's funny you say that, um, if, you know, uh, for our, our team that manages our women's efforts, some of their research has suggested that that actually is factual. So on average, women might tend to just leave their portfolio in a balanced way and kind of leave it there which can be a really good strategy often in the long term. So um, to your point, you know, that, that, that is real. Yeah. So, all right. I'm excited. I think what you're doing is great. I love the fact that you guys, you keep breaking this into you know, more addressable markets and you're know, finding the needs that, you know, different segments have rather than just kind of monolithic broad brush. So I think that all of your good classic training uh, continues <laughs> to come to bear and, and just get better and better. What I wanted to ask you about, just kind of as we start to wrap up, a couple of questions. You know, obviously, our clients at Career Club um, are people that are very interested. They could be job seekers. They could be people that are in roles that they're not loving for some mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. You've built a lot of teams over the years. You, you hire people and promote people and stuff. What are some of the talent qualities, David, that, that really get your attention? Yeah, well... You know, at PNG, we're screening very much for leadership, which can be sound like a very soft skill. But I think, you know, one of the things I learned doing a lot of recruiting um, back when I was younger was it's a very hard skill, uh, meaning, you know, it can be learned, it can be practiced. Um, all of us uh, are getting better at it every day and aren't perfect at it every single day. And, um, you know, that that leadership is is the DNA of of candidates number one for me. I think that adaptability is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think most of us could imagine that we're doing what we're doing. Those of us who went to school, you know, 30 years ago. I mean, just the nature of work itself is is going to continue to transform. And so, you know, your ability to, to have expertise in an area, but then to stretch that and, and to sort of adapt to whatever environment that you're in, I think, you know, that can't be underestimated. And then I guess the ability to contribute as an individual, but then to, to matrix with a team, I mean, any size company, but particularly in the big companies that I've worked with, I mean, to do the magical things that only a big company can do, you know, but be nimble, you know, it comes down to just the, the team chemistry, you know, the culture, how people work together, the quality of the people um, as, as, a, as a group, you know, as well as as individuals. And so I'm always looking for whether people can actually contribute to the group as well as be talented themselves. On the leadership side of it, that's an interesting one. I mean, and say that you were doing you know, recruiting out of universities. Um, are you just looking for the president of the sorority or are, are there other ways that I can demonstrate leadership to you? Oh, such a great point. Yeah, I mean, um, I think whether it's Fidelity or anywhere that I've been, I mean, it's just the ability to have impact in the environment that you're in. It's, it's not about your title, right? It's not about, it, it's great if you were elected to be president of your sorority or of your school or whatever, but I really, what was the impact that you're able to make? How are you able to bring other people along and motivate them? And, um, you know, none of us can do any of this alone, right? So it's really less about leadership, about just what I'm bringing to the party and more about what you can do, bring other people into your vision. So it doesn't matter what you're passionate about doing. You know, I think you can exhibit leadership by just the impact that, that you have. I'm so glad to hear you say that. And of course, it ties very closely to your third point, which is the ability to mesh and, and to work well with other people. And that's what we try to teach people in uh, interview uh, scenarios. And when we're prepping people for interviews is finding that balance of, you know, because people get very worried about, you know, like 
you know, I'm awesome and they feel like they're bragging <laughs> and yeah, they, yeah. they get very reluctant to, most people get very reluctant to do that. So they end up actually underselling their mm -hmm. contribution. And, and the, the key of course is, is understanding what your role was on the team, but to your point, how you were able to help other people do their best work and help contribute to the final goal. I really like how you use the word impact because oftentimes I don't think people always appreciate or reflect on what their impact was on a particular project. It was just like, well, I went to work and I did my job and I went home yeah, and I went back yeah. to work the next day. And then all of a sudden that becomes very problematic when you're trying to build your CV you're trying to interview and David asked you, tell me about a time when you really made impact. And you're like, oh, I haven't really dimensionalized my job that way before. And it's not that the people didn't do the work. They haven't actually given themselves credit and kind of documented their impact. And I think it's a great point, Bob. I mean, actually, it's, it's one of the things I coach, you know, if I'm mentoring younger talent, I mean, trying, it's not easy. But like what happens in the arc of your career partially is that you just get different context on all the same things, yes. right? Um, right. As your group gets bigger and then you're 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 working at an entire enterprise level, your context, you know, changes. So just thinking about how you're making impact and tying it to that broader context, just constantly doing that is half the battle because it may be that even your manager hasn't thought that through all the way. You know, and as you get more senior, they probably haven't because your job gets more ambiguous as you get more senior. So it's like what's the mission of the enterprise what are they trying to do and how can i contribute to that both in my job description and and you know outside of my job description mm -hmm. so we'll wrap up on this normally i would ask the question what advice would you give 28 year old david but I'll <laughs> flip it what advice would you give 18 year old alex <laughs> well um there's probably a lot in that i mean there's a lot of um personal growth, you know, that goes into leadership. So, you know, for my son, you know, we'd probably be talking a lot about sort of the personal side, you know, if it's, um, if your listeners are sort of seeking like professionally, you know, what are some of the lessons that maybe um, I would impart? It, again, depends a little bit on your context, but some of the more universal ones. Um, one of my favorite themes in my whole career is that customer obsession is always an intent, I think everywhere, but there's a gap between intent and operationalizing it. Yes. You know, actually running the play with rigor to make sure that that voice of customer is what you're actually executing against. I feel like I'll end my career on the quest to really do that as best as it can be done. Cause I think that, you know, every company is trying to do that. And yet the S and P 500 turns over so quickly, you know, still, I think 15 years average lifespan. Um, I think that is at the crux of it. And I think it is an under discussed, it's like an overly used piece of language with an under discussed set of operational discipline that actually takes mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I think, you know, if I was talking to Alex and this is, this is, you know, I think a lot of people I admire as leaders, they kind of have the, uh, the growth mindset, you know, uh, which uh, is not my language. Right. But um, it's easier said than done. But I mean, the fact is, is that there's going to be so many, bumps in the road. I mean, this is just true of anyone you ever talk to that's successful, right? It's it's not a straight line. Amen. It's got its share of um, heartbreak and disappointment and, you know, just have to be incredibly patient at times. But if you approach that as saying, I'm, I'm going to grow from the tough times, it gives you a completely different perspective than, well, the, the tough times are going to wear me down and I, you know, I won't have the same energy, you know, to approach the problem because a lot of times success is just that that last try, you know, after 99, you know, failures towards something. And, and it goes to the first point. I think, I think customer obsession is much more about a process, an incredibly rigorous, arduous sometimes process to really do it properly than it is, you know, I intend it, it happens and I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sort of good. Um, I guess, I guess also a third piece of advice would just be, be choiceful about the people that you're working with, that you're with. I mean, your life is basically the people you surround yourself with and we all spend so much time professionally doing what we do. And at the end of the day, you know, the people that you're doing with it is, is your work. Um, you know, a place like Fidelity has just amazing people. It's one of the reasons I was so attracted, you know, to be here. And I really feel that, you know, every day in terms of like showing up and, and doing my, my role and the people I get to work with, it's a, it's an honor. So if you can find that and you really admire the people around you, like that's a huge gift. 
Well, community is huge. I mean, and who you surround yourself with really does play a really big part in who you become and, and who you are, right? I think that's awesome. And you had talked about adaptability earlier and, you know, the pace of change is it's never going to be slower than it is today. It's just going to keep, keep that's going. Right. And so we're going yeah. to have to continue to learn, to grow, to adjust. I did a post recently on embracing the journey. You know, we get so fixated on the destination that sometimes we can even curse the journey, right? <laughs> it's like, like, but like you said, there's the ups and downs, there's the failures, there's the, this isn't going the way that it was supposed to go, you know, and you know, rather than, as I say, curse the journey, it's like, well, how can I embrace this and learn from it, get stronger, learn more perseverance, learn more patience, get more creative. Maybe I'm not bringing enough people to the solution to help me think this thing through, whatever it is, but it's all a big learning opportunity. And yeah. if you can benefit find in the midst of the struggle, it makes it not just tolerable, but it's like, okay, this isn't what I would have chosen, but you know, I can see some good coming out of this and we were coming up with a new idea. Maybe we wouldn't have come up with, had this yeah. obstacle not put itself, you know, we ran into it. So Alex is a lucky boy. He's going to do well. <laughs> well, I hope so. I think, um, yeah, I mean, to, to your point, it's amazing how many people you talk to in their careers and that unexpected twist or even the, the assignment that they got, they didn't really want or seem like it was going to be really hard or whatever, like that became the formative thing that really transcended um, you know, their career. And if we think about movies, right, it's always the unexpected twist. It's the insurmountable, you know, obstacle that people are faced with, but that's who the hero is. It's the, the hero is the one that, you know, somehow perseveres even among amid self doubt or whatever it is that, you know, might be their particular demon in the, in the storyline, they still find a way to persevere. So David, awesome. Is there any last little bit of something that we haven't covered that you would want to make sure that you share with guests? <laughs> No, I think um, I, th I think I think we covered a lot of ground, Bob. We covered a lot in 35 minutes, didn't we? That was good, David. I really appreciate you taking time. I know that you're extremely busy. You're working on a number of cool initiatives, but the fact that you would take a little bit of time out of your schedule, share with us what you're doing professionally, kind of some of your career thoughts, and, and how you're even helping shape your five-year-old son, Alex. I, it, it's mm -hmm. inspirational, so I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Bob. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening. If you're watching this on YouTube, please feel free to comment, like, subscribe. And if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, please rate and review. It really helps. So, again, David, thanks so much for spending a couple minutes with us. Uh, it's been great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. I know.